Good evening, church family. It is April 29th. It is Wednesday night. It is good to be with you this evening. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Leviticus chapter 2. We're continuing our study in Leviticus. This will be our third study. I hope you've enjoyed it so far. Uh, just a 15-second review. The first chapter, we dealt with a lot of details with regards to bloody sacrifices and how they paint the picture. They give us a foreshadowing, um, a copy of what was to come in Christ. And now we're going to be looking at the grain offerings. And in the grain offerings, we are seeing something that's not bloody. Well, every week we participate in the Lord's Supper. And this chapter is going to give us a foreshadowing of what that looks like. And what I mean by foreshadowing or copy is it's an inferior version of the real thing. You see, the grain sacrifice of Leviticus chapter 2 is the inferior copy or foreshadowing of the real deal that we have in the Lord's Supper every week. It's like the difference in having a picture of a sandwich and a real sandwich. No matter how good the picture looks, it's got no substance like the real sandwich. So when we look at the grain offerings, and really following the law altogether in the book of Leviticus, it's important to realize that what we have now, and what we need to be grateful for now, is that, among many, so many other things, is that we have the superior version, where they had animal sacrifice and endless animal sacrifice at their own cost. We have Jesus, who was once and for all at his own cost. And they had a grain offering, that had to be offered regularly and had so many ingredients and so much specialty that had to go into it. It had to be offered with incense. The oil had to be blended from several ingredients. So much going on here. And instead, what we're presented with in the New Testament is the bread representing Jesus' body and the juice representing his blood. That is so much simpler and it represents something so much better. Also, communion, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 16 through 18 we actually have a communion with God that's what that word means a link we have a direct connection to God through Christ he is our intercessor whereas in the Old Testament you would offer a grain sacrifice with the oil and the incense you could offer even a blood sacrifice even the best of your flock and you still had to go through the human priest and it still was never enough so we have the best of everything in fact, the more I study the Old and the New Testament, the more I appreciate being on this side of the cross than then. All right. Well, let's begin with the grain offering. The best grain was offered for the meal. And, of course, this represents how we should offer our best. One really interesting dynamic we have in Christianity is how God wants us to do our best. He wants us to obey Him. He wants us to offer our best. But it's not directly tied to consequence. Let me give you an example from Scripture. You remember the story of the widow who gave two mites, the last of what she had. Jesus said she gave more than all the rich people there had because her sacrifice was greater. You see, in the Old Testament, you would give a sacrifice. It was costly. It had to be repeated. But even if you gave everything, it was still never enough. Well, in the world that we work, you know, for example, you work a job, you get your wages. You know, your work is directly tied to your consequence, at least most of the time. But because of God's grace, even our best, even though it's never good enough, because of Jesus, because he sent his son, because Jesus paid the price, it can be accepted by him. And even all the sacrifices and all the uh, offerings given in the Old Testament were accepted because of Jesus, just in advance. You see, everything depended on Jesus. Jesus is the pendulum through which the whole Bible uh, settles. Uh, there is no such thing as a law that matters without the coming of Jesus. And there's no such thing as a church that matters without the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and his sinlessness. One reason why the 
grain that was offered had to be the best and the bloody sacrifice that had to offer to be the best because that represented, that told us that's what God was going to give. He was going to give his best and it was better than anything we could have offered. My wife sent me an article just this past week on how 44% of people who call themselves Christians, so that's a pretty loose term in that uh, context, 44% of people who call themselves Christians do not believe that Jesus was sinless. They believe he was just another man. That's a very disturbing statistic, but it's also not surprising. And the reason why there would be a bunch of people who call themselves Christians but believe Jesus wasn't sinless is because of apostasy. Now that's a word you don't hear that often anymore. But what it means is, is to believe something perversely, to take something true and to twist it into something evil or wrong. And in fact, this is in many respects the greatest enemy of a faithful church is a liberalization of an understanding of what the Bible teaches, uh, a watering down of what the Bible teaches, uh, apostasy. Paul refers to it also as anathema in Romans chapter 6. The idea that we would take something so true, so pure, so necessary, and turn it into something earthly and gross and incomplete. And that's what happens if we have an understanding of Jesus that is imperfect. It also goes against all the foreshadowings and all the types that we have in the Old Testament. You know, we were only to give our best and anything less wasn't acceptable. Well, if God gave his best, wouldn't that by definition be sinless? You see, if you start tearing apart God's truth and perverting it, you also tear apart and pervert all the foreshadows and copies that point to them. None of this makes any sense unless it's all remained whole. You can do the same thing with the virgin birth. I'm not going to go into detail with that here. But if you deny the virgin birth, there is no way to consistently hold that Jesus was the promised Christ. No way. And that's another study for another day. I have papers on that, lectures on that. If you'd like to hear it sometime, just let me know. Well, let's uh, talk about the oil. The oil had to be blended from several ingredients. It had to be offered without impurities. And this represented our unfettered gratitude to God. The oil also represents Christ's anointing because kings and priests were always anointed with oil. We know this from the time of King Saul and David and Solomon and the other kings. Uh, this was something that Jesus was uniquely, a king and a priest. And so when he was anointed, uh, he, and what I mean by anointed is that you go to his baptism and remember the Holy Spirit came down on him like a dove. See, his anointing was greater than that of oil, greater than that of man. It was done by God and it was done in a divine way so that we knew at his baptism that he had been anointed both king and priest. That's an incredibly important concept to understand about Jesus, that he is uniquely those two things. He's also a prophet. He's the only character in all of scripture that meets all three of those terms. Another thing unique about the coming Messiah in the Old Testament. Well, the meal offering also had to be offered with incense, specifically frankincense. And this represented our prayers offered up to God. If you've ever done anything with incense or anything like incense, it's smoke, it rises. And that's to represent our prayers offered up to God. In Leviticus chapter 24, which we'll get to way later, uh, verse 7 in particular informs us that frankincense was offered with the bread as an offering to God, as the fragrance was brought about through the fire. Well, something else about the meal offering is they had to be offered without leaven or honey. Both of which, okay, this is important to understand. Keep this in context. Leaven or honey are not evil in and of themselves, but they represent, they're symbols of evil, just like birds are in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Birds, of course, aren't evil in and of themselves. I, myself, quite like birds. My kids sometimes catch me watching online videos about birds because I grew up with birds, so I like them. Don't have one now, don't really want one now. It's just something I enjoy. But all the same, in the Bible, they symbolize. So leaven, honey, birds, they symbolize sin, corruption, lust, malice, and hypocrisy throughout the Bible. Let me give you a modern-day example that might help you understand why these things were chosen to represent evil. Uh, let's use the word pig. Well, a pig, of course, is an animal, and 
Uh, we can eat it and raise them and things like that. But we also use it as a prerogative term, don't we? We say like, you know, Kevin's a pig or something like that. And if we use it in some context, what we mean by that is maybe he's stuck up. Maybe he's got his nose in the air. Uh, or we might say of, of somebody else who's a pig, well, that just means that they're overweight or that they're a glutton. You see, pigs in and of themselves aren't any of those things. But we have turned it into a symbol. Well, all the same in Jewish culture, that's what leaven or honey or birds represented, was sin, corruption, lust, malice, and hypocrisy. And so that's why the meal had to be offered without it. It's not because those ingredients were in and of themselves evil, but rather it represented that the offerings we give God, and therefore in the New Testament, taking this uh, a step significantly further, Romans chapter 12, our lives should be without sin, corruption, lust, malice, and hypocrisy. Uh, something else interesting is that the grain must be offered with salt, which is the opposite of leaven. Salt preserves and flavors, representing God's grace and how our lives and speech are always to be seasoned with the grace of the good news, the gospel. Matthew 5, 13 through 16, Jesus at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount gives us the New Testament parallel for this idea. The salt also gives us a foreshadowing of Christ's body, which did not corrupt. We know from ancient times up until now that salt preserves things. Well, of course, Christ's body would be preserved unto his resurrection, just as ours will be. Now, let me explain that a bit further. Some people are buried. Some people are cremated. Some people die in accidents. You know, some people are buried at sea because of battles and things of that nature or boats that have sunk. Uh, so what does that mean that our bodies are preserved? Well, not preserved in the sense of like, boy, I've got an illustration for this one. This is something you may not know. I'm a, I only know this because I'm a amateur student of Russian history and I, I enjoy the complex nature of the relationship the United States and Russia has had for hundreds of years. And in Moscow to this day, Vladimir Lenin's body, and he died in 1924. He was the founder of the Bolshevik Communist Party that started the revolution in Russia and, and ushered in the Soviet Union. His body is still preserved to this day and on display in Moscow. Yeah, that's a real thing. <laughs> uh, so obviously, when I say that our bodies are preserved under resurrection, uh, and, and Christ, Christ's body was preserved under resurrection, I'm not referring to the physical intactness of it. We're not Lenin, and thank goodness for that, right? That's not the point. The point is, is that God has preserved us. Otherwise, we are more than our physical body, and we still have our physical body. Even if it is buried at sea, even if it is scattered in ashes, God is going to resurrect our bodies. Supernaturally, through divine means, we will be resurrected on the last day. And salt represents that preservation. That's the foreshadowing of the copy of it. And you think about something so simple as salt, so cheap as salt, so uh, disposable as salt, something we just take for granted all the time. But it's in the ordinary that if we're willing, we can see the divine. And I, and I mean that. And more and more as I grow up, I, I realize and as I age with experience and in seeing life through especially my children's eyes in time, is that everything around us God has made. It all has a divine spark. It all matters. Uh, and I'm not using pantheist language. I'm not talking about God is in everything. That's not what I mean. What I mean is that God made everything, and therefore everything matters. And we can see his handiwork in all of creation. And it's up to us whether or not we're going to appreciate that. But that doesn't change the fact that it's there. Well, the grain for the bread also had to be ground. Now, if you've ever ground anything like in a dish, you know, a stone dish with a stone, and you really ground something uh, to dust, so to speak, or to ash, you know, uh, something like that consistency. Well, this represents Christ's bruised and pierced body for our transgressions. Uh, in the King James Version, uh, it, it actually refers to the bread being bruised. Now, that's a funny term for us, but the idea is ground in the original language. 
Isaiah chapter 28, verse 28. And we know that Christ was bruised and pierced for our transgressions through uh, the New Testament accounts, but it was also predicted in the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 5. The Jews, had they uh, had all of them paid attention to the Old Testament scriptures, would have known that their Messiah would have had to suffer in this way. It was known a thousand years before it happened. Well, also, the meal sacrifice was sometimes baked in an oven, and this represents our offerings that are made in secret. Uh, when a when something is in the oven, now in modern times we have you know light bulbs and a little bit of a screen, you can kind of see what's going on. But I find I usually have to open the oven anyway to really see how it's going. Uh, well, of course, you know at that time you put something in an oven, and up until recent times you put something in an oven, you wouldn't even know it's there unless you had put it there. Uh, so these are our offerings that are made in secret, just as Christ's prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane were offered in secret, and also. Jesus told us to pray in our closets, that a good chunk of our prayer life, especially our private prayer life, should be just between us and God. And nobody else needs to be a part of that. We don't need the praise of men. Rather, we seek the reward of God. The meal sacrifice was sometimes also baked in a flat, a flat plate or a pan. Uh, our offerings made in the witness of men, but to the glory of God. Uh, the cross was also a flat plate, if you think about it, and Christ was offered on that as a sacrifice for all. So you can see the multiple uh, imagery here, the foreshadows and the copies. Really fascinating. Uh, another times, at other times, the meal sacrifice was baked on a frying pan or a skillet-like apparatus. These are offerings of praise and faith during a trial. The frying pan also represented Jesus' mock trial before the Jews. Uh, this is a phrase we even use to this day, if you think about it. Uh, we might say, well, you know, they really went through the frying pan. And what we mean by that is, is they went through something very, very difficult. And of course, Jesus' trial, his beatings, the crucifixion was all very trying. Being betrayed by friends. And what I mean by friends is we often think Jesus being portrayed by Judas, but he was also portrayed by Peter for a temporary time. Jesus himself predicted that and it came to be. Well, the meal sacrifice, this is something that's not, I don't think, as commonly known, was eaten by priest as a memorial as to God saving the people of Israel from Egypt. It was consumed weekly. Now think about that. How often do we consume the bread offered in communion in the church? Every week. So if you were to have communion at a different interval, you would break the shadow or the copy. You wouldn't just be breaking the New Testament command and example, but you would also be breaking the foreshadowing. The foreshadowing always was that we would participate in a set-apart meal, a sanctified meal, a holy meal. We know this as the Lord's Supper of Communion in the church every week. And so again, if you change the pattern, if you change the command and the example in the New Testament, you don't just break the command and the law and the practice of God that he set forth, but you break all the foreshadows and copies we had thousands of years before that. It's only when we obey God that all the puzzle pieces fit together and we see how this all makes sense. Well, Leviticus chapter 2, verse 6 tells us that the bread was broken and eaten by the priest. All the same, the bread is broken at the Lord's table and eaten by the priesthood of all believers. So you see there again, the priest ate the bread. And who are we in the church? We are the priest. The, pr the priest ate the bread weekly, as do we. And of course, finally, the meal sacrifice was meant as a memorial. We know this from Leviticus chapter 2, verse 16. And we know the Lord's Supper is a memorial. It's not just a memorial, but it is a memorial. Luke twenty-two nineteen. Now this is interesting. In Hebrew, the word for meal is just another word for gift. It's kind of like the word for prayer in the New Testament. It's just another word for ask. You can't have a prayer without asking God for something. And you can't have a meal in the Old Testament without it being a gift. The meal offering was not a bloody sacrifice, but rather a gift from the people of Israel to God in gratitude for his rescuing them from Egypt. All the same, we see foreshadowed in the meal, or this gift, offering our opportunity to meet around the Lord's table every week to remember Jesus' sacrifice, to examine ourselves in light of it. 1 Corinthians 11.28 and not to forsake this weekly divine appointment, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. I've had a lot of people contact me during this lockdown about how they didn't attend church as regularly as they should have. 
And now that it's been taken away from them for a temporary time, they realize just how precious that time is. And boy, I just can't tell you how true that is. I want you to think about the Lord's Supper. I want you to think about the foreshadowing and the types and the copies that tell us from the very beginning of the Bible, you know, we're only in the third book, we're in Leviticus, about what God expected and what he had established and how we would practice in being New Testament priests today. The idea that we should be in church, the idea that we should take communion weekly, the idea that we should study the Word of God together and offer our gifts and give our best, these are ideas that are as old as creation itself. It's something God has expected of us from creation itself. You see, he's done all the providing of not just the instructions and how to do it and want to do it, but even the means. The ability that our imperfect gifts, no matter how good we offer them, no matter what our best is, our insufficient gifts, because they are insufficient, no matter how good or how great they are, he has also bridged that gap with his son. And so we really need to remember that church attendance isn't optional, but at the same time, it's a mistake to view it as only a duty. I just can't emphasize that enough. I do not let church or Bible study or my prayer life or my obedience to God be a burden. I just won't let that happen. Because the moment you do that, the moment you turn into nothing but duty, nothing but rule following, it's not sustainable. And the children of Israel fell into that same trap. And people do that in marriages. They think that they eventually just boil down their marriage to, I just have to do this, I just have to do that. you know. And that's a marriage that won't last. Well, all the same, it's a relationship with God that won't last if we treat our church attendance and our Bible study and our prayer time as nothing but a duty. I think that's how people fall out of practice with it to begin with. It's so important uh, that we meet Jesus around his table every week. We need to understand that he's waiting for us. He expects us to be there. And we should be. And by the way, he's welcoming us with a smile. And when we're not there, there's not this desire to strike us dead from heaven or anything else ridiculous. But what there is is a disappointed Lord who gave his all while we didn't. Of course, this was for the necessary spiritual nourishment of the people of Israel, and even more so for us now. It was to remember what God had done for them in rescuing them from Egypt. Well, even more so, we have it to remember Jesus' sacrifice. This is there so that we examine ourselves and we confess our sins as priests unto our God. We seek his forgiveness, and by the way, we receive it when we do so. Paul says that all these things were given to us for our example. 1 Corinthians 10, chapter 6. And so therefore, just as the priest performed the meal offering faithfully, so we are called to be faithful in our attendance around his table. All right, well, that's an overview of Leviticus chapter 2. We touched on a couple of verses. We'll come back to it in more detail next week. Uh, but I'm glad you were able to join me tonight. I hope you learned uh, something really interesting from this chapter. There's so much to get from Leviticus, and it's unfortunate it's a neglected Bible book today. We hope to right that wrong in whatever little way we can. All right. Well, it was great to study with you tonight. Take care, and God bless. See you soon.